Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please hang around a while. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Behavioral Corner. My name is Steve Martorano. I am your host and guide as we gather here uh, to talk about uh, behavioral health. Uh, behavioral health is um, produced in conjunction with our underwriting partner, Retreat Behavioral Health. And we'll tell you more about them in a moment. We're going to take something of a departure for those of you who are familiar with the website on uh, on this edition. And uh, we're going to sort of uh, bring you up to date on what we've been about as we approach our 150th podcast. We thought we would restate our mission and tell you what our intent was all along. First of all, when uh, Retreat Behavioral Health signed a board to be our underwriting partner, uh, they gave us editorial control. They said this doesn't necessarily um, should be be a infomercial for them. Uh, they wanted it to be informative and entertaining and enlightening, and we hope we have done that. They're terrific people, and uh, if you are in um, the process of looking for a place or getting questions answered, we can recommend them to you. So anyway, 150 podcasts under our belt. Uh, I like to say this is a podcast about everything because everything is what ultimately affects our behavioral health. So we have uh, ranged far and wide with our with our uh, interview subjects on, um, I think you'll realize as you look around, uh, we touch upon a lot of different things. Because as I said, everything affects the way we behave and our moods and our um, overall well-being. We thought we would take a look at a couple of recent programs, measure your reaction to them, because that's very important to us to find out you know, what kind of feedback we're getting, and give you an idea of what we're thinking about going forward. So if you got a couple of minutes, this won't take very long. We, we hope you'll uh, find it informative. That's the whole purpose, as I said, as we take a look back at 100 and approaching 150 episodes of the Behavioral Corner. I, I'm going to begin uh, taking you back to a, a, a most recent, uh, I suppose, episode, it being February, and that, of course, designated as Black History Month. We thought we would take a look at what the Black history was about, something about its origins, what it was intended to do, what it is doing. And we thought we would do that rather than go to a historian or an academic uh, or an activist. We thought we'd go to um, the garden variety African-American uh, and see what they felt they were getting out of, if anything, um, Black History Month. So to that end, we welcomed back to the program a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, a fellow by the name of Paul Brown, who is an acquaintance of mine. Paul is, among many other things, a podcaster. He's an entrepreneur. He owns his own business. His wife is a physician. He's raising his children in the, the uh, Mount Airy section of uh, the city of Philadelphia. He is uh, a very lively guy, very smart. He is steeped in his culture and talks about that on his podcast, which I recommend to you. It's, it's uh, called It's Always Personal in Philadelphia. Paul's a very, very bright guy, and we were delighted to have him with us a couple of times. What happened with the Black History Month and his take on it is that it, it, it uh, resulted in a very spirited uh, back and forth in the comments section on the Behavioral uh, Corner website. Um, which was interesting because while often people have commented on the programs, there's um, not often the kind of interactive, I wouldn't say argument, but discussion that went on, uh, but such is the nature of the topic. Uh, I, I don't want to characterize everything Paul said to us during that podcast. I would urge you to instead go back and take a look at it. Um, but in, in essence, what he was saying was that, that, Black History Month has historically been designated to highlight and promote Black achievement in, in, uh, in history. And it's done a great job of doing that. That's, that, that's uh, a terrific uh, purpose. Paul's desire was, as a young African-American, that maybe they would tell a broader story. Maybe they would um, move beyond, look what we've accomplished, look how far we have come, and talk a bit more about the totality of the Black experience before they were slaves 
in uh, in the Americas. And I, th I thought that was an interesting take. Paul, as I said, is a uh, well-read guy. He um, doesn't often accept the doctrinaire view. He brought to my attention something that I wasn't really that conscious of a while back when he talked about uh, generational trauma, how generations, succeeding generations can be traumatized by an event in their history, even though they weren't directly involved in it. And he certainly thinks there's something to the notion of uh, a trauma associated with slavery in the African-American history. But his argument what seemed to be centered around before we were slaves, we were not slaves. We were people living in our own, in our own uh, uh, countries, in our own world. We had our own civilizations. And, and perhaps going forward, he would like to see um, Black History Month devote some attention to that aspect of the uh, of the story. And it shouldn't come as a surprise, it didn't to me anyway, that the reaction to that show was spirited, uh, it was lively, and it was divisive. There were people who disagreed with a lot that was said there, but more so in general, the idea of race in America and what it means, who's responsible, what the impact has all been. And I think if you look at the, and go back and listen to Paul's comments, Look at the uh, video, take the measure of him. As I said, he's a bright guy. And then look at the comments that follow that. It's kind of illustrative of where we are uh, or where we remain as a society over the issue of race in America. It, it uh, still is a, um, there is still an obvious divide. Black History Month, it, it makes me feel like an other again in a sense that it, Black History Month, it should just be American history. And it should be taught along with history, right? As opposed to being separated in the shortest month of the year. And to, for the most part, Black History Month has been extremely whitewashed to a point where we only get nuggets of information that don't really tell the true story of what my ancestors uh, did in this nation to make it stand up to its original values. I mean, we're still doing it. Paul's comments and his opinions, and they are just that, his opinions, inspired a lot of give and take, which we, um, we like. I mean, we like that. We, we like to hear what you're thinking when uh, you hear these uh, these topics. And we're always looking for suggestions with that regard. So as we look back at some of the recent episodes, I would recommend that one right away because we still are, of course, in the month of, uh, of uh, February. Um, another program that I'd like you to take a look at involved a fellow by the name of Chris Massamine. Uh, Chris came to my attention through a newspaper article I read in the New York Times, an extraordinary story of uh, Christopher, and the title of which should give it all away, a uh, large picture of Chris in, in, the, in the paper, and the headline was, Can This Man Stop Lying? And I thought, well, that's interesting. The guy's in the New York Times because he's a liar? Well, it turns out, yes, that's pretty much the problem. We've all heard the expression, um, pathological lying. We toss it around like we know what it means. In, in fact, it's only very recently that researchers are looking at people who can't tell the truth and wondering whether or not this is a character flaw totally. You know, they're just liars. Or whether or not there may be an underlying mental health issue at work here. And, and certainly Chris is interested in the answer to those questions as well. The story that I read that inspired me to invite him on the program was extraordinary in its candor. Uh, this is a fellow that had a, a bright career in, in uh, theater management in the Midwest, lovely family, uh, who was a fabulist. He just made up stories, extraordinary and florid tales out of whole, whole cloth. He, he just uh, couldn't stop himself from making these stories up. Very often they were not associated, at least immediately, with any gain. I mean, you know, from the time we're children, we understand if, if mom wants to know who ate all the cookies, it's, it's kind of, we're kind of hardwired to go, I didn't do it. There's a gain there. You're trying to deflect blame. Chris's lying was of a different sort. Um, it seemed to be not connected to any immediate gain. 
He just told stories and they are extraordinary. Well, naturally, it catches up to him, as most lies do. And uh, that's why he joined us to talk about how he was trying to repair the damage his lying had done and try to get to the bottom of what was causing this. What's fascinating about the uh, interview we did and the fact that he's so honest about his behavior is that it occurs, his lying occurs in the sort of golden age of lying. I need, you know, list the number of people who've... Uh, captivated our attention for many, many years, certainly more so now than ever, because of their ability to just lie. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that this interview with Chris occurred before we learned the truth of the congressman from Long Island, Santos, who is from pillar to post, an absolute fraud. Everything about his resume, everything he said about his life, his background uh, was made up. And now he sits in the United States Congress, shamelessly sits there uh, and says he's not going to resign. Everybody says uh, these little lies, missing for the moment that his not lies were not little. So the idea that I would have a fellow like Chris uh, Massamine on to discuss his particular issue with just that problem struck me as timely. And uh, you might want to take a look at that. Here, here are a couple, just a couple of the things that Chris told us on that program? So I, I've got a, a couple of disorders. I've, I've got major depressive disorder. Uh, I have PTSD. And then, of course, uh, the cluster B personality, where the lying is um, part of that. But um, obviously, through the research that's happening now, trying to change the DSM, um, it, it does feel apparent that the lying can be its, its own thing uh, that stands very much uh, solo. Uh, it, it's been hard kind of reconciling some of the things within the, um, the cluster B personality and not everything fits. And I think that's why they kind of group a bunch of things together and say, okay, you have cluster B personality, but the, um, the lying has always kind of been like you had put it a coping mechanism. And, and really as it grew over time, it just became more and more compulsive, more and more addiction, like where it's, it's been something that's kind of controlled my life, whether I, I wanted to or not, whether yeah, it was yeah. coping or not. Well, I, you know, you, can't, you really don't get a sense of how uh, bizarre some of these stories were and the uh, damage that occurred in Chris's life, which he's now trying to struggle to get out from under. It's very difficult, as you might imagine, to rebuild your, your career when your resume is a you know, a, a fabrication and and you've lied to your colleagues, but he's doing that and he's brutally, brutally honest about what his lying did, the people it hurt, and how he's trying to get a handle on it. So, uh, and, and as, a, as an interviewer, I, I've never, and I've interviewed thousands of people, I've, I've never had in front of me someone who was an acknowledged liar. Lots of the people I've interviewed lie, and they lied to me, I'm sure. But they weren't acknowledged and admitting that they were liars. So it was an extraordinary interview. And you, I dare say, know somebody in your life who probably has some trouble with the truth every now and then. This might be an insightful thing for you um, to take a look at on the behavioral corner. Finally, the program I would urge you to go back and look at, we have a couple of programs, but one in particular involving a, uh, a young woman by the name of Erin Riley. Erin uh, uh, is a very successful uh, career woman. She had a marvelous career in uh, the music business for many, many years, met many famous people, went many terrific places, uh, and enjoyed a, a, a pretty, um, I would say, successful business life. Uh, on, the, on the personal side of things, she has had a, a very bad situations with the men in her lives. And so she came to us with a story that we call toxic relationships. And uh, she told it in as clear and as brutally honest a way as you can imagine. She was explicit in the damage done. She understood she had some role uh, as an enabler uh, when she found herself in a relationship that was destructive, not only to the relationship, but also to her um, mental health. And she struggled to get out of it, which she has done successfully. Incidentally, 
She's now the author of a successful book called A Dark Force, where she talks about toxic relationships and um, the role narcissism, malignant narcissism plays in these relationships. This was another program that caused a lot of activity in the comment section, because unfortunately, uh, it's not an uncommon situation that people, women primarily, let's be honest, but we, we haven't heard from men. I'm sure they have e examples, but women have these problems with the men in their lives with devastating effect, uh, devastating and shattering effects. Aaron told the story brilliantly and, and, as I say, brutally honest. And here's just a couple of the things that she shared with us when she was on the Behavioral Corner. He was never physically abusive, but I will tell you, Steve, that the mental and psychological and emotional abuse that I suffered is, is just as bad, if not more so, because it goes on longer. If somebody hit me, I would know to leave, okay? But if somebody is constantly projecting that you're cheating or blame shifting you or not answering questions or gaslighting you and challenging your reality. If you just get confused, your brain turns to mashed potatoes. You can't make a decision. You're afraid to do anything, you know, and it goes on a whole lot longer. So course of control is actually something that people in Europe are actually suing for now uh, mm -hmm. and winning court cases on this because it is so psychologically damaging to a person. It's like, taking your soul away. So, uh, so these people, they really can't regulate their own emotions and they don't really have empathy. And so they just suck it from another person basically. And so, yes, it just, it, it just destroys who you are as a person. And I have been working very hard for the last two years to recover myself. And I'm happy to say that I feel really great now. I really do. Again, that was Erin Riley. And uh, I point out her book, A Dark Force, is available on Amazon and it's a good read. I've, I've read it. And it's, um, if you find yourself in this situation, it's you, you quickly discover you are not alone. And maybe you can use Aaron's example and uh, as, a, as a guide to help you out of whatever situation you find yourself in. They're just a, uh, three of the more recent programs that we've done here. I think they show you a, a, a wide swath, is that the word? Swath of our. Uh, of our coverage, but I urge you to take a look at our site. The, the site is, in, in effect, a uh, virtual library in that the podcasts don't disappear. They go up on the shelf of the Behavioral Corner uh, website, and they sit there for you to peruse, take one down off the shelf, and look at it. As I said, we're approaching 150 and if you are a, a substance abuse sufferer or, or have somebody in your family who has substance abuse issues, you'll find lots of information about that. Uh, we like to stay as far ahead of the curve as we can. With regard to substance abuse issues, we were talking about fentanyl uh, before lots of people knew how to spell it. So you'll find lots of information about fentanyl and its dangers. If you're a sports fan, we have examined the role of fandom plays in our in our uh, emotional well-being. I don't have to tell you that um, the root word for fan is fanatic and the behavior associated is also often like that. We, we did our first interview with a Hall of Fame uh, sports writer uh, who uh, joined us at the beginning of the pandemic because there weren't, wasn't going to be any sports. And in addition to everything else the virus was doing to us, not being able to escape into sports struck us as something that we should talk about regarding behavioral health. And Ray Dittinger, the uh, writer in question, did a great job in saying, yes, yes, people are going to have to, uh, you know, buckle down and try to get through uh, several months of no, of, no, uh, of no sports. So movies, if, if, uh, if movies are something you're interested in, we cover movies, but we do, we, we do it from a different uh, sort of angle. Uh, two of our favorite guests, uh, Grace Schober and Maggie Hunt from Retreat Behavioral Health, join us as the movie mavens every several months. And what we do with the ladies is we'll take a program, a movie uh, or television program uh, that is about substance abuse or mental health issues specifically. And both these very successful career women uh, and uh, mothers and wives are now 
they also suffer from substance abuse. They've been sober for many, many years now. So they love movies and they know what they're talking about when it comes to those issues. So they review those, those movies from that perspective, from the perspective of been there, done that. And we had great fun. Uh, and, and I gained a lot of insight into hear them, hearing them talk about, well, that's not the way it is, or that's exactly what I remember. Uh, if you've ever watched a, a courtroom drama and not been a lawyer, how many times are you going, is that, for, is that really what goes on? Do lawyers really do that? Well, it's an opportunity to see some very famous movies and television programs and have two very smart women who, as I said, have been there and done that, analyze the movies and tell you what you can take from it that's accurate and what you should just dismiss as Hollywood nonsense. A lot of people can do addiction, but not a lot of people can do the like withdrawal recovery process. So like, it's easy to pretend you're like a drunk person, you know what I mean? And like, it's easy to show the consequences, but then like the transition into yeah. uh, is not what is real life. It's called the movie mavens. We have a handful of them on the site as well. Uh, they are always fun. And we in fact have scheduled, we should be scheduling a couple more uh, uh, very soon. So as you can see, I said at the beginning, the behavioral corner, is about everything because everything affects our behavioral health. Um, we have covered all those topics and we will cover many more. And I would urge you to um, let us know what you think about what we're doing and um, you know what we can do better as well. If you have any sh show ideas you'd like, please send us a note to the website, behavioralcorner.com, because we read everything. Uh, listen, we, we uh, really appreciate those of you who have found the uh, podcast and who are following it, we know that our social media posts, which you, you'll find everywhere on Facebook and Instagram and, and other places, we, we know you see those. Uh, we, we love that you respond to them and you do uh, we get a lot of likes there. Um, but we are particularly happy when you subscribe to the Behavioral Corner. Uh, and that's simple enough on the homepage, there is the button push to subscribe. That, that's really our bread and butter. That's what keeps this thing going. And again, it's a it's a library of back programs, almost 150 at this point. So there's a lot there for you to peruse. And I hope you will find more than a few that are both informative and sometimes entertaining. That's it. This is our uh, our first uh, who knows we're going to do this again, review of what we're all about here on the Behavioral Corner. Um, we thought it was time to uh, reintroduce ourselves to the uh, to the podcast audience. Again, thanks for those of you who like and follow, and those of you who are going to subscribe, we appreciate that as well. And look for us real soon again. We've got a bunch of neat shows coming up uh, in the uh, spring and then summer months, and uh, we're hanging on the corner, the Behavioral Corner. Thanks, Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner. <laughs>